Hello and welcome everyone to the webinar Unexpected Applications of Accelerators. Uh, this, is, this event is part of the Accelerator Teaching MOOC, Research Facilities to Support STEM Education. My name is Mijelina Partega, and together with my colleagues Rocío Benito and Diego Fernández, we would like to thank you for joining us. Before I pass the floor to our speakers, I would like to cover a few housekeeping topics. First, please make sure your sound is turned on. We would like to remind you that during this webinar, your cameras and microphones are off. Secondly, if you have any questions, you are invited to write them here in the chat and we will address them in the end. This webinar is recorded and we will publish it in the course. So you can also watch it later again as you wish. Uh, you will also have access to all the slides and the link, links shared during the webinar. And now I would like to welcome our speakers. Today with us we have Christine Darf and Kim, Kim Lefman. Christine Darf currently works in the European Spallation Source in Sweden, but before she also worked at CERN in Switzerland and Fermilab in USA. Beyond particle accelerator design and operation, she has established several outreach and educational programs. For example, she's the co-founder of African School of Physics and Nordic Particle Accelerator Project. She is also the chair of the Forum on International Physics and the American Physical Society. Then with us, we have Kim Lefman. Kim Lefman, uh, he's, he represents uh, University of Copenhagen, um, and he has been working with neutron scattering for more than 30 years. Uh, first as an instrument scientist at Triso National Laboratory, and since 2008 as a professor at Niels Bohr Institute. He is the chair of the Danish Neutron Scattering Society. In his research, he specializes in neutron investigations of magnetic and superconducting materials, as well as simulation of neutron scattering instruments. And now, without further ado, I would like to first pass the floor to Christine. So good morning or good afternoon to everyone. So um, after this uh, nice introduction, so we will uh, try to dig down a little bit in the world of accelerator. So the name indeed accelerator teaching, I think is really appropriate. So accelerating particles or accelerate making and improving your training. So what I will uh, present today, so will be the possibility to see from the size perspective and maybe as well the time, we can see a bit later on, how we could look at an accelerator. So particle acceleration. Now we uh, focus on those high stories, so the big one, but as well the um, more emblematic one to say hello story. So all of that uh, has to start, uh, and it started in uh, 2028 uh, with uh, Lorenz uh, um, Ernst, Lorenz uh, that you might know as well from the Manhattan Project, from the Oppenheimer Project. Um, this is a lot uh, to do with as well size there and with impact. But if we look at how it's all started, particle accelerator, it could have hit in his hand at that time in 20. 29. Now, almost one century later, you see here the LEP and the LHC, which are 27 kilometers long and that are circulator, the circulating proton. Initially, it was electron. And now this is across the border between Switzerland and um, France. And this is where I've been working. So both, uh, you can see, so here with the LHC, which are composed of magnet. So both between Switzerland and France with the LHC, but before that with the Tevatron, so big synchrotron that give us possibility for uh, discovery to have a better understanding on what we can um, discover and, and get through. So here you see over the years, the different type of accelerator that have been, whether with electron or with proton, giving possibility to reach higher and higher energy. And all of that quite often by cause and thanks to the size of the synchrotron. And uh, the, the energy here, so you will see up to the tera, so the te tevatron, so meaning the tera electron volt uh, that give possibility for higher energy 
and then for the production of the Higgs boson, as you can, you may remember. Now, in terms of quantity, we speak about 35,000 particle accelerator, and this is a growing number between uh, 20, in, in the year 2000, there was already about 15,000. And it's difficult to assess how many particle accelerators exist in the world. But most of them, and you can see this uh, so from this uh, little pie, so this is mainly for utility, so meaning for saving life. If you look at uh, the, the, the radiotherapy, so whether with photon or with proton, it could be as well with iron or with carbon. So there are now possibility by accelerating so those particles, charged particles, to have uh, some cure, some um, therapy that will give possibility to expand so your life. So beyond this larger distribution as well, so this is thanks to industries and with the implementation of iron on the surface of material. So this is really to have possibility to implement precisely so at uh, the atom level, so on uh, the, um, the surface of those materials, uh, some different ions, giving that way a greater toughness as well to the material. And like this, you can imagine, for instance, being able to drill as well and having a longer lifetime as well for those tools. But as well, you could think in terms of corrosion. So this is also a possibility to improve the property of uh, uh, those materials. So those iron implementation also, thanks to the industry, will give you the possibility to think, for instance, on building better prothesis. If you look at the medical application, so if you look at something stronger, if you look at corrosion prevention, then you can think of improving even life, uh, looking at human life, of course. So, and uh, beyond this, you, you see here, so I was uh, putting it as well in uh, this um, form, that of, this is above one giga electron volt, which is those large scale that uh, we saw in the slide before, meaning particle accelerator like at CERN, called the LHC, so the Large Hadron Collider, or the Tevatron. But you see, it's really a small fraction. So it's why we have those 35,000 particle accelerators. So the most known being really for the research because they are really emblematic. And you heard about the, the Higgs discovery as well that help also to promote particle accelerator. But an important part as well is to say that at least one third of uh, the Nobel that were provided and that were um, so given in the field of physics and chemistry were originated thanks to particle accelerator. So research and those development can really bring uh, a lot uh, for our world. So now how do we think? If we think now about the revolution and those evolution and revolution, so the industrial revolution, we could think in a, in a, in a way in terms of those evolution in time that it's building up. Uh, so from the concept uh, from science, which is like all those research that give possibility while maturing to develop some technology that are important, then to be implemented in a business uh, model, in a business phase, so that we could, in our society, benefit from all of that. So now, if you think this now information revolution, so which was just after the Second World War as well, giving possibility by a better understanding from the solid state viewpoint, to then develop all those different ships, the World Wide Web that you know also based on uh, this internet, that gave possibility for uh, those different uh, portals and uh, the different multimedia that we all use now, so that it can be now part of our society. So all of this based on science. And remember, one third of uh, those Nobel came from particle accelerator. So at every level, we can really find some way to understand how we can develop that thanks to those research and how to apply those research into the society. And here I take the last one for the case of DSS, so for the case of the neutron world, but always in parallel with the photon, so we like as well the light source. What you see here for this molecular um, aspect, so this molecular revolution, so having possibility nowadays to think as well how to become uh, 
still human, but maybe a bit more machine as well, by having possibility for those nano technology to be implemented and support our quality of life. So I like uh, this, uh, um, this kind of paradise, this evolution, and we can come back uh, to that if there are any questions. But what I want to also emphasize is this ecosystem. So thinking and looking at how everything evolves when you are teaching or when we're thinking, this is really how we can make this as well sustainable by having the possibility to teach and to train. So academic, this is what will weave, give possibility for scientists to bring those capacity for development. And this is really at every level. So we really need to have the student interested so that they can in the future contribute to a better environment, a better organization of all of that. And of course, it has to be related to uh, infrastructure because all the, the different infrastructure are based on what is available so in uh, and for them to be able to do the hands-on, for instance, if we look at uh, the level of the student. But for us, um, it means uh, for the case of light source, for instance, or the case of neutron source, to have the research instrument and the research infrastructure that will enable those discoveries. And in the modern world, if you look at ending up at organization, we need industries. So it means that we need as well the money, the financing to be able to do that. So this is why I like to call for this ecosystem with uh, those uh, free um, um, stakeholders, we would say. So now if we look and we focus on uh, the um, particles accelerator that will give possibility to get better material, a better life science, and a better facilities. So we will um, introduce the ESS. So if you think in terms of how to observe from the macro to the micro, and this is what our research instrument give possibility to do. So we have, uh, as we are the macro, more or less so looking at the human, but we can really go deep in the detail at the atomic level and also beyond that, so to try to understand what material can do. So for the case of the ESS, this is really to enable science for the society. So science for the society, which is complementary to fundamental science, which is at CERN, trying to understand how matter, how the nature as well is, what the Big Bang has been. So if we look at life science, and if we look at material, this is what we call society in some sense. So it means to enable that, then we need neutron source and we need light science. So we could that way develop a better advanced material as well. And we can study the building block of the human body. We can try to understand as well the protein. We can also develop a, a bit more on that as needed, but the enzyme as well that are the structure of uh, the, the chemical process. And we can develop as well better instruments, better tools that could be environmental friendly to get a better uh, battery or to get a superconductor that uh, will be discussed uh, a little bit later. So we skim. So if uh, we look now at the case of the ESS, so particle accelerator, this is um, an example, there you have a linear accelerator. But remember the synchrotron, like the case of CERN with the LHC, Large Hadron Collider, which is possibility to change the energy level. If you have a linear accelerator for the case of the spallation source, the idea is to reach uh, so 2 GeV, 2 giga electron volt, while the proton is hitting a bigger uh, atom. So now, Let's start at the beginning, and you can see much more in that link that from the ESS will also go towards also the DMSC and more of the data. But now, imagine that you are a proton. How do we get proton? How do we get neutron? Only charged particle can be accelerated, as you guessed. So it's only electron, proton, and those ions that could be accelerated. We just start by a little bottle of hydrogen, or it could be as well water. We are looking at that process. So thinking about a bottle of hydrogen, and this is exactly the same for the Tevatron or for the LHC that I was uh, mentioning at the beginning. You use this bottle of hydrogen, you have a little flow that will come to this ion source, 
And in the ion source, you have really strong magnet that will excite uh, all those hydrogen atom, and that will then separate. You will make uh, this plasma, and that will give possibility then to separate so the proton from the electron. And doing that, then you get rid of the electron by um, simple shield, and then you just accelerate this proton. Proton, this is an H plus, and this is how we start. So the, the trip of this proton accelerated thanks to normal conducting structure, like they will be packaged thanks to different structure. And again, I can go in detail, and I think you might have questions from what you saw in the earlier course. So we have something called, for instance, so the transport line. So it means is no action that could be the low transport line, medium. So this is the MEBET and then the, the high, so the HEBET. But in between, you are packaging those protons that will travel in the vacuum always. So along those 600 meters, you have a vacuum and the proton will be in that tube accelerated by magnetic, I mean, different type of um, more or less electrical field that will give them energy. So the idea is to transfer energy, so momentum, from those accelerating structure to the proton that will be going faster and faster. After, um, so because of uh, the, the, the potential arcing as well, so we need to use um, AC. So initially it's DC so that you can accelerate the, um, for instance, DTL. So RFQ will package everything. So this is a radio frequency, so uh, um, um, a quadrupole. Then you will have after that the drift tube linac that will accelerate them up to half of the speed of the light. And at this level, so the proton will um, be, because it's really massive, also something to remember is the proton is 2,000 times heavier than the electron. So you need really high electrical field to be able to move them further. So if you have then alternating, so RF, then you can go to higher velocity and you can have then possibility to arrive to almost the speed of the light, but never the speed of the light. That was one of those questions and answer when it will be colliding here to the, the atom of tungsten. So that's this heavy uh, atom that we'll describe later. But to be able to go from half of the speed of the light to almost the speed of the light, you need really high magnetic field. And again, this is what uh, in uh, the presentation I was showing those three, I mean, the free finger, which is really trying to understand how to accelerate while you know that uh, you have so the magnetic field and uh, the electrical field. So your, the motion of the particle will then go in this linear direction. You need those high magnetic fields, so you need supraconductor. And this is there, and you will understand the phenomenology as well of those supraconductors a bit later, and thanks to Kim. But look at the, the application that we'll do from this knowledge to be able to use material that will really provide really high electrical field and really high magnetic field. So this is how so the proton will be able to reach almost the speed of the light when then colliding in a heavy uh, in a heavy atom. So we use tungsten why because it gives possibility for solid target. So then I can just so this is sorry I, I was uh, so describing those two aspects. Then when you fired all of them into this target, which is tungsten, more or less by each proton, you will get about 30 neutron. And this is what the spallation is. So spallation is giving possibility for a light, at a light um, charged particle to generate neutron. And this is what we need. So it's a neutron source. This is the result, the result of interacting and colliding at really high energy, the proton into those tungsten. And you can see here how it is shaped. So it's only 2.6 uh, diameter, 2.6 meters in diameter. Uh, this uh, um, so uh, target, which is made of tungsten, 
And then by generating all the different neutrons, so in all those different azimuts, we just keep um, some of them and we have to moderate the energy. So we have to moderate the speed. And this is uh, what we call the moderator. So all of that is done. So thanks to so cooling helium and the moderation is done with hydrogen. So you really give possibility to only uh, keep the neutron that you want and all those neutrons, you will then guide them in uh, so those guys that will then have possibility for the instrument to observe in uh, that special place where the sample will be installed. So when we speak, and that might be as well from what you read from DSS, so those sample will be uh, in an environment that can be as well high pressure or, or, or low temperature. It has to be um, not moving so that you can understand the structure and can read the different uh, position of the atom. And you can have then possibility as well to see the energy which is uh, in this atom. So that's the advantage of the neutron, being able to read um, all the, 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 the map of uh, this uh, uh, simple. And, and again there, Kim, so we'll explain this a bit more. So what uh, we do with this neutron source in a linear way, it's complementary to synchrotron. So there I, I don't have, I mean, described too much, but I guess that in the course you can see and read more. So the synchrotron, so that is the light source, for instance, which is at a max four. So our neighbor here giving possibility to um, understand also very similar and very complementary uh, as well to what is happening here. Very complementary information on biology, on material quality, and how with much lower cost because you accelerate electron. So electron being 2000 times lighter, it, you don't need those supraconductors, so no magnet, no helium that is very uh, expensive, no superfluidity. So it's a, a factor, uh, I would say a, a factor 10, at least cheaper, to have a light source than to have a neutron source. But there are a lot of users so in the world. And I think it's even more than 60. I think it might be even 100. I read it somewhere else. So again, the information is always difficult, but it is a growing number. And you can find from the PFL, for instance, in this document, much more information. So how to establish all of those um, understanding on material and life science? So thanks to Photon, that's the easiest way. And every national, every country, more or less nowadays, have a light source and have possibility to, to use uh, so those uh, sample to understand. Now, neutron, so it's complementary because, as you will see, so from uh, uh, so Kim, so the um, uh, light source will, thanks to the X-ray or thanks to the photon, accelerate uh, get possibility to uh, scatter only the electron which are at the periphery of the atom was with the neutron with the neutron you really go deep inside of the nucleus and this is um, all the different neutron um, the neutron source that we have here so a neutron you all know the radiation that is coming also from reactor so reactors are often using uh, as a research instrument. So a lot of them also available so in the different countries so that are listed here. Some of them, those research reactors are also getting closed. But the higher flux, and that's also what could be described a bit later on, so will be coming from those spallation source. So the spallation source, thinking about uh, what I was describing with the case of the ESS, you mainly have one here in Oak Ridge, so in Tennessee, sorry, here, and one in Japan with uh, the, the g -Pop. So it means that uh, in Europe, uh, this is this ESS, which will give possibility for a very high flux of neutron and having possibility also in a safe manner to be able to, while we stop uh, the flux of uh, um, proton, meaning what we stop the production of proton with this ion source, it means that we will don't we will not do this reaction, uh, chain reaction like in the case of a reactor, which can be dangerous as well. So neutron source using spallation is also a safer way to um, do the research in our field. 
So on um, this note, so this is when I will uh, pass the, then the floor so to my colleague uh, Kim. And we can keep the question maybe for the end or now. If there are already questions, but. We'll have questions at the end and Kim, go ahead. Thank you, Christine. OK, fine, thanks. Um, yes, let me uh, let me slowly catch up. Do I have the. The control of this, I think I have. Um, so yeah, as Christine said, what what we can do with the nutrients is is a whole lot of things. We can we can study the materials all the way down to the atomic level. That is, we can we can see how the how how matter is built up in crystals, how the in, how the atoms are sitting within the crystals. We can see if if matter forms aggregates like 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 protein biological molecules we can see this the size and shape of these molecules um we can see magnetism neutrons are very sensible or sensitive to magnetism so we can see magnetism on the individual atoms and tell them apart and that has quite some advantage within within electronics and things like this we can we can see surfaces how surfaces are 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 composed, um, and we can also use it as as imaging tools. You know, just like hospital X-rays, but just with neutrons instead, and that will give us different contrast. Now, what can we use that for? Um, one thing is is we can use it for 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 energy purposes. Uh, there is a lot of uh, of, of energy applications. Um, one thing is that that hydrogen is mentioned often as as one of the potential energy carriers in a future society. And neutrons are just very, very good at localizing hydrogen, where it sits in the material, where it's stored, where, uh, and how it's moving. And, and we need to understand all this to, to make the next generation of, of, of materials for the hydrogen society. Um, we can make we we can look at food. We can look at how very complex things in food. Like one of the examples is milk. Little fat drops in milk is is what makes gives milk the color, the taste, and all this. And of course, the, our, how we manufacture food um, influences how we experience the food. So we need to understand what we do in order to tell the companies how they can how how they can produce uh, and, and and preserve food better. There is a lot of there is a lot of applications within health. Uh, as I said, we can know how the hydrogen sits. Hydrogen is 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 very abundant in all biological molecules. We can see how proteins curl up uh, when they fold in uh, in in a suspension, and and all this is extremely helpful to medical companies when they want to know how they should uh, make the next generation of medicine that is more efficient. Has 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 fewer side effects and so on. And um, other types of, of materials, there is just plenty. Um, our light emitting diodes that can emit uh, different uh, in different colors. Now it was a big thing a few years ago when 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 you could make blue light with with, with diodes. And now now we just use it everywhere for our uh, for for lower energy consumption, just just daylight like lighting in our homes, and it's things like this we want to we want to develop. One of the things that I study myself is superconductivity. Superconductors is is a very amazing property of material that below a certain temperature it has no electrical resistance, so you can just conduct current basically around around the whole world. Today you only will transport even 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 high voltage uh, electrical power over 1000 kilometers after that it, it doesn't pay off anymore but with a superconductor if you could make a superconductor that could be that could work at room temperature you could just make a cable all around the world and everybody could tap into that cable it would be wonderful um, but we don't have it now because superconductivity is only only happens at lower temperatures than we can achieve 
uh, easily on uh, in, in technological applications. And therefore, we like to find the better superconductors. But this is just one out of many examples. Let me carry on here. Um, here you see what, what I mentioned before. Um, the diagram here, let me get the laser marker, that one here. Um, here you see different atoms, hydrogen, heavy hydrogen, deuterium, carbon, nitrogen, and all the way up to iron. And this, this, they have a number of electrons. And here you see how, how much they scatter from an X-ray point of view. See, hydrogen basically invisible, and the, the heavier the atom, the more the better X-ray can see them. Fine, fine, fine. What about neutrons? Neutrons are here in the green. You can see hydrogen is pretty visible. Uh, sulfur is not, and it, it's just not a uh, it's just not a straightforward process. It's very difficult uh, to to even calculate how neutrons uh, interact with different with different atoms, and we basically have to measure it. But one of the good things that come out, comes out of this measurement is that uh, normal hydrogen and the heavy hydrogen deuterium scatter differently, and that means that we can use this as a biological marker. If there's a particular thing uh, that we need to track in a biological system, we, we exchange the hydrogen for, for, for deuterium so that it scatters better, and we can then later on find out where in the biological process did that molecule go. This would be very difficult to do in any other way. Here we see a, uh, this is a museum piece. This is a, um, this is a Buddhist statue. You can shine through it with x-rays, see how it's like inside. Of course, you are not allowed to open it because this is, one thing is that it's a holy piece, but another thing is that it's, it's unique, it's a museum artifact. Of course, you're not cutting that up. But you can look into it, and it looks like this. With x-rays, with neutrons, it looks like this. So what you hear notice is that there is some wooden spike inside that you couldn't see by x-rays. And the reason we can see it by neutrons is that it, there's a lot of hydrogen there. And the hydrogen, as you see over here, attenuates um, the, the beam somewhat, and therefore, you can see it more clearly. So if you have both x-rays and neutrons, you can more easily penetrate matter. You can more easily see what's inside. Um, here again, oh, this is an illustration of, of what I told you before, that, that, you can, that you can see the hydrogens in, uh, in protein structure. So here's a complete protein. And this is the protein as seen by x-rays. You see everything except the hydrogens. But sometimes the hydrogen is, is, is important. Sometimes the hydrogen is actually the things that binds, binds together different parts of proteins and so on. Um, and here, basically, again, to repeat what I said before, neutron penetrates, they probe magnetism, they probe proteins and hydrogens. You can use it for make better drugs. You can use it for efficient high-speed high trains if you have the right magnets and superconductors. You can improve electrical cars if you can get better batteries, uh, and so on. This is, um, this is, these are basically the five, the five reasons here that neutrons uh, are useful, sort of scientifically. Their wavelengths fit very well to the, to the distance between atoms. The energies fit very, very well to the to the vibrational energies in molecules and, and 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 solids. They interact only weakly, which means that they can penetrate deep into the material. They are non-destructive, so they uh, the, the, the material still lives after uh, or, or still exists after you you, you have shot into it. Um, and they have the different contrast, so that you can see different things that that uh, x-rays cannot see. So um, if you want to know more about it, there is a nice YouTube video here with Sindra um, that, that can show what neutrons are and what they can be used for. Uh, I can recommend it. It's, this, is, this is highly useful. And you will get this link afterwards in the, um, um, uh, in the recording of, of this. Now. To go on, I, I want to be a little more uh, detailed 
about what ESS is. Um, ESS is a source of neutrons, and with this source of neutrons, you can measure with different instruments. This is what we call, some people call them beam lines. I prefer the word instrument. This is a measurement station. There will be in Italy 15 instrument stations at the ESS. And they come in five different classes. Here, diffraction. There are five diffraction instruments. They have these names. Some of them names from Nordic mythology, Heimdall, some of them not. Um, but that's that's of less important. But the, the important thing is what diffraction is. That is that is the thing where the neutron will behave as a wave. It will it will scatter. That this wave will scatter from the crystal, and from the from the interference pattern where the wave is scattered in the crystal, you can deduce the um, the, the spacing between the atoms. You can also deduce how the individual atoms in the crystal are, are localized. It's a very powerful method. Um, small angle scattering, well, the name all, almost explains it. Neutrons are scattered at very small angles, also as waves, but uh, they, are, they, are, they are scattered by, by larger aggregates. So as, as, as I told you before, biological molecules, curled up proteins and stuff like this. And uh, the bigger the bigger the aggregate, the smaller angle they are scattered at. There are two small angle scattering instruments, Loki and Scardi at the ESS, and they will be used to study things like biological molecules and polymers and food. Reflectometry is, as I said before, you study surfaces, uh, the composition of surfaces. If a surface is composed of layers, it will very, the neutron will very easily see how, how the composition is. Two reflectometers there, Freya and Estia. Um, imaging is as is the one I, I showed you before with the with, with the Buddhist statue that you shoot through um, and get something that looks like hospital x-ray images. And inelastic scattering, also known as spectrometers, is, is where you see where you you see the motion of atoms or molecules or motion of magnetism within materials this is something that's often used in more in in more fundamental science to understand what what are the underlying forces that determine the structure that determine the uh, 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 how, how molecules aggregate and so on and we have five of these instruments here So I go even more detailed, and now I will actually show show equations. You can take it. Um, this is diffraction, scattering from crystals. What is a crystal? A crystal is regular pattern of atoms. Here they are in blue. Here's one uh, lattice plane, and up here is another lattice plane, and you see how they are very regular. Now I only draw two dimensions, but imagine that there is a third dimension coming out of the uh, uh, out out of the slide, and it will look all the same. And here is a wave. The wave, the neutron will, according to quantum mechanics, it will also be a wave, and uh, we can determine the wavelengths. I'll 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 come back to this. Um, and here is, a, here is the same wave, but in another path that will hit this crystal plane, and this part of the wave will hit this crystal plane. And then we have to ask ourselves, will there be constructive interference of the, the, the outgoing wave so that we can actually see it? So we see here is, here is the wave front, this is up, and to the right, this is also up and to the right. So they are, this is the front, and here is the outgoing front from here to here, this is the green line. And so we have to see this, this the wave that hits the, the lowest lattice plane that has gone a little further, that amount FGH further than the other wave, and that path, FGH path, has to be equal an integer number of wavelengths to make it uh, constructive interference, so an infinite number of wavelengths here must equal FGH path, which is, if you do your trigonometry, 2 times D, D is the spacing between lattice planes, and times sine of theta, theta is here, 
known as the scattering angle. Theta is also here by equivalence of triangles. So the, the wave has angle theta to the lattice plane and scatters incident angle equals exit angle. And it will scatter if this equation is fulfilled. And since we can know lambda, we can, and we measure theta, then we can deduce d. And this is how diffraction works. Let's see it once again. This is a concrete instrument, Heimdall at the, at the ESS. Um, the beam comes in here. Here is where the researchers sit. Um, this is the diffraction detector. Forget about everything else. This, this scientist here is standing looking at the setup and I'm sure that the beam is off at this time because if the beam was on, he would not be standing there because well, some radiation is emitted and, and it's not nice to be too close. So there is actually a big cave around here. You, you, it, it's not been put into the drawing. In any case, you see the dimensions these detectors will measure all the neutrons that are scattered in all different possible angles, and they are scattered according to Bragg's law. So how do we determine the, the wavelength of the neutron? Well, there is a fundamental quantum mechanic De Broglie relation saying that the wavelength is the Planck constant divided by the momentum, or if you may, mass times velocity. Fine. But the velocity we can know from the time of flight. So it happens so at ESS that the neutrons are produced in flashes. So flash goes, goes neutron and then you wait um, a fraction of a second and bang, you detect on the detector. And from the detector, you, have, you get a timestamp. You have a timestamp from when the flash was. And that means that you can determine the, the length, the flight path. Sorry, you can determine the flight time and you know the flight length because you, you, you certainly know the distance from the source, which is 162 meters up here and all the way into the sample and out to your detector, 165 meters. Uh, you know that very accurately. And then you also know the time. You divide them up, you get the velocity. And then from there on, you get the wavelength. You put the wavelengths into the Bragg law. You have also measured theta. So you have measured now lambda and theta, and you can deduce d. Um, this is how data will look from this is a one-dimensional cut. This is two-dimensional cut from the from the detectors where you have time on one axis and the and the lattice spacing on the other axis. But let's just look at this one. Nice. Um, we have reduced d. So each neutron will will take us take upon it a certain d. And then we count the number of neutrons. This is simulation, of course, because it's not, it's not running yet. So the number of neutrons simulated up here as a function of d. And then we can see, start from this side, the highest d. There is a nice peak here. There's a peak here, a peak here. Peaks, peaks, peaks. Now they get closer and closer and closer. Uh, that's because you can both have lattice spacing this direction, this direction, but also something intermediate and like this and like this. So. The, the lower you go in D, the more possibilities there are, but you can see there's a whole pattern here. And this is a fingerprint. This is a fingerprint of a particular structure. And doing data analysis of this, you will, as I say, know what is the, um, what, what is the whole crystal structure. Um, we have some, we have some, uh, some, some school material that will tell that we have made for this course that we will that will tell you how the different techniques work in a little more detail than I was able to go into now. So there is a link here. Um, yes, I, 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 I will not I will not go through all of this and I can see that Michelina Michel wants to I say something. I can tell comment if you if you don't mind indeed because for the, the reference indeed this is an important one. This is important. If you click on that, we cannot show you, but please do so, because this is a way to understand for every different, uh, there is by category, meaning by age or by discipline or by um, language, how for your learning material you can find information. Uh, and again, this is something where I would recommend that um, 
So as teacher, so everyone look at it in more detail. Then indeed, uh, this aspect was to look in an advanced way because remember this MOOC, I was mentioning the, the massive open online course for the Nordic country. This is what we have uh, developed back in 2015, also on a European grant. And in that one, so we were looking a bit more in an advanced level at the bachelor level. But here you will find as well much more information about the ESS itself and looking at the instrument and looking at the accelerator. So those two documents are those technical um, report that we as scientists have to build up in order to construct and to have the funding to um, generate. Uh, so this, um, those ESS, um, uh, so research instrument. So, this is a bit American, unfortunately, because of my background, but um, it's really interesting um, brochure as well that will explain everything that you can do with an accelerator. So for this one, so looking even how at Le Louvre huh, for culture and heritage, so they have possibility to go deep with those eyes into the matter and understand what is behind special painting and uh, what you can do as well with uh, paleontology. And, and there, there is a lot. Huh? For instance, we have uh, um, uh, this MOOC that uh, uh, we are now building. So beyond the, um, so this one, which is uh, so accelerate your teaching. So we have a, a possibility to understand how, for instance, for the case of uh, the universe, uh, particle accelerator could be used, or for the case of environment, uh, we could use as well accelerator. And here I want to emphasize another grant, which is, pardon, IFAS standing for innovation for FASRIC accelerator in science and technology. And in that grant, there was a work package looking at challenge-based innovation. So there, thinking about students of um, more advanced level, maybe than high school, but how students put together, coming from multidisciplinary area, from physics, from engineering, from economy, from law, or from communication, all together, we gave them some information about what a particle accelerator is, how with a light source or with a neutron source you can work. And together, they had to use or think on what an accelerator can do for a societal challenge which is related to environment. And this is why I, I wanted to complement as well last week when you had as well those questions. Those students, again, at an advanced level, maybe, thought about how for the case of the, the and you will see in that presentation from the student who was communication. So she does a master in communication in Paris, but she presented the winning project, which is, um, you know, in France, in Brittany, you have a lot of pig. And the pig generate a lot of um, debris, let's say, <laughs> that will be uh, then in the water generating some algae. And they, are, they were designing so an accelerator that could, by irradiating those algae, cleaning the water in that environment, in, in, the, um, in the sea. So, so you can see there are a lot of ways to use accelerator for environment. In this case, this is what uh, that uh, grant is done for. And here you see for the FIP. so on the forum that we have every uh, month, so we have a, a colloquia, and that uh, specific case was presented here, so by uh, Nicolas Delerue, who is uh, uh, so uh, leading uh, this uh, challenge-based innovation. So there you can see much more. Indeed, so that was the, the reference and all the platform where we wanted to bring you as well to learn more. So this is the, the MOOC that I was mentioning before. So three different set of transferring knowledge. So in terms of how light source can be designed, the different generation of them, the spallation source, so more or less what I described with a view on what you can do with that, the different colliding physics. So for this, um, so fundamental science, understanding CERN, understanding also beyond CERN with the FCC. So there are a lot of um, explanation. A second MOOC, which is how you will design your own accelerator if you want, what you need, the ingredient. 
So a bit back to what I was describing, so the magnet that will be able to steer the particle if you want synchrotron, uh, the electrical field that will accelerate, so the cavity, and I was mentioning the supraconducting cavity with this supraconducting part, which is most of the quantity of uh, uh, where the uh, particle will get uh, the acceleration for our proton in the case of the European Spallation source. So this is the, the second MOOC. And the third MOOC that we had developed there was applied. And it was applied to medical applications. So there we have, you can really understand more detail on how Adron Collider work, pardon, how Adron therapy could be generated. So thanks to uh, so the, the proton, so an Adron, or how a photon like um, photon therapy can also be used. And then I want to mention those colloquia series, the one that is just finishing now. I really promise that you have to learn more and look at that. It's all sustainable. So you will hear much more about Professor Phil Manning. So this is this little appetizer I think that you had from last week with looking at this five minutes of presentation of what paleontology Right, uh, I mean, one hour ago, we had them together with a paleontropologist, so whom uh, was presenting as well in physics matter in uh, March 2021. So a presentation for the evolution, human evolution, and it was for the 150th anniversary of uh, Darwin's book. So I want to hear now the different question and answer that they had, and this is right now happening. So, but it's all recorded and you'll have more possibility to know if you connect to this uh, uh, forum, which is open, this is exactly our goal. You don't need to be an APS member. Of course, we recommend that you do, but everyone can have access. This is the policy that we try to, to get. And why also? Because of course, in, uh, in Africa, so this school that, uh, um, so I started in 2010 with a colleague. Uh, so we have now possibility to, to disseminate the information. In that school, so, also, we do a lot for teaching teacher, and we're teaching to high school. So you can see much more information um, in our webpage. And those little movie that we did, uh, so specifically for the case of this MOOC, give us the possibility. And this was thanks to the producer whom I met uh, while we had uh, the pandemic. So in 2020, he was uh, producing, and he's a physicist, so he was uh, I mean chemistry, but he was producing little movie called Science in the City. You might know the Big Bang Theory, but this is applied to a story happening in Africa by giving example, realistic at the end, summarizing what was um, this special movie about. So again, this is some little hip so that you can see a bit more on that. And looking at um, how to how to excite, how to inspire your student, how to engage student as well. Listen as well to the next uh, uh, Physics Matter. So in November, you'll have to hear, to listen to so Professor uh, Carsten Wells from uh, UK, and he will show the physics or the fiction in the case of Star Wars. So again, a way to engage the younger community to understand if a laser can be like uh, this uh, one. I mean, again, you can discover much more there. And in uh, the, um, so, uh, the school, uh, um, the presentation just before, so you will see much more article. And I think in the module one, so we put as well some reference to what uh, and how Professor so Carsten Wells is engaging with the community. You will see much more also with Zoe Fisher for the case and apply to DSS. I think it was just before, so you have the knowledge about that. And now some more about uh, as well. So Christine, who will bring you to the deep side of the supraconductivity. And this is so thanks to Kim Lestman. So a very nice from what we heard. So supervisor to give possibility to best understand the phenomenon of supraconductivity. So how to improve a supraconductor, how to understand all of that. And uh, we had, so this is, so Professor Menning who is right now presenting on another live heaven. And uh, this is Zoe and this is Christine that you will hear about. And Christine will open up as well to 
data, so to all those machine learning, how could we in this evolution curve that I was showing, make something even more performing, so like those high performing computing, going now towards those automatization and other method to think and to improve our way of working, our um, science research that would then open up to much more development. So quantum world not being far away from that, I would say. And here, this is just a, a summary that gather uh, the different aspects with, again, 40 slides, so a bit more detail with by continent, how from the ESS, from uh, the, the African School as well, and the Forum of International Physics, how do we try to tackle the different uh, uh, societal challenge and how each of us can contribute as well by uh, knowledge. And knowledge is really what we need in this world, as you can imagine. And, and this is really also science for peace in one sense, because it's education. And this is what you are as well all responsible of. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, both, both of you, Christine and Kim. Um, and um, we still have five minutes, so maybe we have time to sneak in some questions. Um, and I would like to start with a question from the chat. Um, so maybe Kim, you could uh, answer this question. Do you think that alpha fold for protein 3D structure prediction, AI based, could become as accurate as 3D structure from accelerators? I have a hard time answering this because it's so far from my field. There is no doubt that the alpha fold is, is extremely important, um, but but the it it will be, I mean, since this since this comes from AI and machine learning, it will need input from experiments, and we will provide the experiments. But whether it at some point will take over, yeah, possible for known classes of proteins, but for new classes of proteins, we, we will still need the experiment. It will be. It will be uh, both both sides of the coin. You, you need to see it. And, and if I can dare also answering a little bit, because Kim, this is exactly why we are thinking about this additional grant and why detector like accelerator can be as well working together in this method of machine learning and detector where the background can be improved. There is a lot of, uh, I mean, performance improvement to gain from there. And yes, definitively, we we need to invest more money there. OK, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so then we also had some questions from the MOOC beforehand. And for example, we had a question about what do we still not know about accelerators? So what is there still a know maybe about accelerators and also about physics? If you think about now, we try to have super short and super compact accelerator. Look at this Nobel Prize as well that was just now looking at those uh, very small uh, um, pico, which is really here in Lund. So this is what is exciting. So I cannot describe uh, all of that, but please read about that. And this is there. So you can have accelerator that are reduced in size. So it means that you need super compact uh, electrical field that will bring possibility. You can find ways as well with the pulse to have really, really small pulse. And this is what it is about. So how the electronics now will be able to follow. This is another limit. But how to accelerate faster, how to accelerate uh, heavier particles, how to accelerate at lower cost. This is, of course, what we all look at. And for that, we need supraconductor that could operate at higher temperature. Because, for instance, those uh, supraconductor, the cryo module that I was, I mean, I didn't look into detail, but I can speak for hours on that because I was responsible for that part when I first arrived 10 years ago at ESS. So this is where we could really gain a lot if it was higher temperature operating supraconductor. So there is a lot that we can do with that. And, and of course, you can use them for, um, that's one of the things, those advanced-driven uh, um, advanced uh, system, which will generate energy at lower cost. So this is there that we need to put more, uh, more cost uh, as well, I mean, more finance. Okay. Um, yeah, that's that's still quite a lot to, for, for work for us. So maybe we can, we have time for last final question. Uh, maybe Kim, you could answer this one. So. Um, how do you think we can motivate students about the importance of studying accelerators, taking into account that in most cases, their priorities are different? 
Of course, but you remember what I was showing is that you can excite them as well just by uh, trying to yeah to understand how to accelerate again acceleration this is a play on word which is useful for them how they can from the space i mean for me for instance uh, this was also uh looking at this paleontology so looking at how dinosaurs have been living and again so phil manning will explain all of that but how to as a student interest them with that they can be interested in different discipline if they like data this is exactly also where they can contribute uh, with computational science to have a better computer, more effective one. They could understand the cosmos. You know, CERN, we visit, and, and I was working and I'm still connected there. There is so much with this uh, science gateway, for instance, that a, a, a young kid could grab as well from this universe how to understand that. This is also our responsibility, how to transfer and how to teach and is much more of course perfectly good Kim, any any last thoughts um but just just adding to this i would say that uh as as, as scientists we stand upon the shoulders of one another so it's not like that i need to know everything about accelerators and people in in that are studying protein folding uh biologists that want to know about you know or, or pharmacists that want to know about medicine would not know a lot about accelerators so we i rely on christine and her colleagues to do the accelerators then my biology colleagues will rely on me to build the instruments that can that can measure it and then and and to the computer scientists that are doing the data analysis programs and then they can go on from there so it's not like that all students need to learn everything because n nobody has a big enough head to encompass everything. Yeah, exactly. And the more and more data is, and more knowledge is all gathering all the time. So I guess we need also to collaborate. Um, and uh, I think this is maybe a good way to end uh, this webinar. Um, so with this accent, I would like to thank you all for coming. Um, and again, thank you both our speakers for joining. Um, and uh, I would just like to wish you, I guess, pleasant evening. Uh, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.